What is a test model? How do models inform testing? Why talk about test models? I want to say this, that all testing is based on models. Now, your experience might be that uh, on a training course, trainers and testers tend to focus on what we call the standard test design techniques. Now, they're called test design techniques, but really what we teach is we teach them as clerical processes. We don't teach modelling. Now, what we find that when we try and use the techniques on real requirements, it's quite hard to apply them systematically and comprehensively and to rely on techniques only. We still find that most tests are guessed, not designed. In the What is a Model uh, video, I said that models are at the heart of test design, and I'll say that again, because they are. But I want to talk about, initially, uh, how we teach test design, typically in the certification schemes, but uh, in other classes as well that you might find on the internet and uh, commercially. When we teach a technique, the, the usual way we present uh, the exercises required you know, for you to learn these things is we might uh, provide a, uh, a question like this. Using this prepared requirement, fragment, uh, it happens to fit equivalence partitioning or boundary values or some other technique. Create tests using this technique. That tends to be how we uh, provide examples of techniques in use. And so what we do if we were using, say, boundary value analysis, we'd look at uh, the ranges that are given us in the domain that uh, we have to work with and each uh, range within the entire range of values that uh, a value can take we look at the boundaries between these ranges between these partitions these equivalence partitions if you like so what we do is we identify the ranges first and we look at the extreme boundaries of each range and then use those extreme boundaries as values as test values and we use the appropriate requirement that we're working on to uh, calculate an outcome from the test that uses those boundary values. Now, the certified courses in particular emphasize the classic test techniques. And so everybody knows them. We've all seen these in uh, online and in books and obviously in classes that we may have taken. But I have to say, hardly anybody uses the techniques exclusively to test software and systems. That is, we have to use other approaches uh, almost inevitably, whatever the requirement, however those requirements are described and defined. Because when we encounter real, messy, incomplete and fallacious requirements often, we kind of guess what tests might be useful. Now let me explain why this happens, because it really is a problem in our business. There's a thing called the transfer problem, and I'm uh, referencing some uh, content in the Domain Testing Workbook, uh, the references below. Now, the authors comment on how exams are presented to students and how students perform when presented with certain types of question. So, for example, uh, many of the questions that are presented in an exam are similar to the questions that the students have uh, practiced with in their classes and with homework, if you like. And the examiners typically take uh, one question as an example of how to use multiple techniques, whatever those techniques are, and to test how students can look at more complex problems using the tools that they've been taught in combination. Now, what we find is that in almost every case, the students uh, are quite competent and can handle the simple one technique based uh, questions, you know, they can handle these and can uh, give reasonable answers. But almost every student will fail the more challenging question, which requires a combination of techniques. And if you like, the, the more complicated, more challenging uh, questions are a better representation of what you'll see in the real world. And this is the problem we have that's called the transfer problem. How do we transfer the the 
un unintegrated skills that we uh, need and how we combine them into a set of skills, a set of tools, if you like, that we use uh, based on problems in the real world. We need to know how to make a selection, how to make a choice of the tools we're taught to make the best use of them to solve the problem at hand. And the transfer problem is, is well understood by academics across all subjects that require some mathematics or engineering uh, or some software capability. Now what we tend to do is we teach uh, the test design techniques in certific certification classes um, as procedures to follow because ultimately the questions you see in the exams tend to be multiple choice and so for the questions to be fair the questions present a fragment of a requirement and tell you almost which technique to use to answer to respond to that question. Now, in the real world, we don't get requirements which say and use equivalence partitioning on this requirement and use boundary values on that requirement and use state transition testing on another requirement. We don't get the techniques to use with our requirements. We have to figure out how best to use the knowledge we've got. And so a skill that we require but is not often taught is how we select techniques to best fit the requirements. Now, in effect, each technique is based on a different model, whether it's a flowchart or a model of the, the domain uh, of, of, of values that uh, are appropriate for a requirement or a state model or a state transition diagram and so on. We have to figure out which model to use and therefore we have to create our own models and then use the test design techniques and that's how it works. So modelling helps us to simplify the problem, but also to, it allows us to understand how best to use the different techniques that are at our disposal. Now, sometimes it's required that we create our own models because none of the standard models fit the problem we've got in front of us. And so we should understand how we create our own unique models, perhaps, to solve our own unique problems. Now, for example, I want to talk about coverage for a moment and just say that a requirements document is a model. It's not the requirements document are not the requirements. It's a model of the requirements. It's some text that describe the requirements as understood and as communicated by the stakeholders, the users, let's say. So given a requirements document, if I asked you in a class, um, what element types can you see? What can what things can you see? What entities can you see in a requirements document? You know, what could you count, let's say? You might say, well, I can count words, I can count sentences, I can count pages, sure. Uh, maybe there are sections, the 1.1, 1.2, and so on. I could count features. If I could uh, have a rule that says this is how a feature is defined in this requirements document. And I might look within the context of a feature for conditions or specific business rules that the software must obey. So a requirements document is a rich source of information and it is a model, but we might choose to simplify requirements by identifying sections, features, conditions or rules. What we can do is we can define a coverage target such as all sections coverage, one test per requirements document section. Now that might not be a good requirements target, so probably we would look at features and maybe look at individual conditions or rules in a real situation. Another model we might use uh, could be a flowchart, and this might be a flowchart that represents the, the business process, let's say. Um, what element types can you see in this model? What can we count in this model? So sure, we can look at uh, activities or processes, you know, the rectangles in the diagram. We can look at the decisions that are made within the flow through this process. We can look at the links or connectors, you know, the arrows, if you like, that connect um, the uh, activities and the decisions. And we can look at the individual outcomes of each uh, decision, the individual uh, outcomes for every uh, true or false uh, question in the in the process itself. Now, you might be familiar with using uh, a business process uh, as the source of knowledge, which you look at uh, paths through that business process, accessing the system as you go as a tester. Uh, 
uh, and covering the model, covering that flowchart, if you like, that process. And that would give some confidence to our business users who are using that business process. Now, what I want to say about models and coverage is briefly is, if you like, we if we have a, a graphical model, there are elements on that model that we can count. And in principle, we can set a coverage target based on whatever type of coverage item we choose to define, whether it's features and uh, conditions identified in a requirements document or uh, decisions or decision outcomes in a flowchart. And of course, we can look at other types of model like uh, state transition diagrams, uh, collaboration charts, sequence diagrams, all those kind of things. We can pick out things that we can test in those kind of models. And the general idea of using models in this way is partly that we use a model that is relevant to our stakeholders, whether our stakeholders are users, systems architects, or developers. Uh, and in principle, two testers using a similar model, not necessarily the same model, should come up with a similarly effective test strategy. That is, a similar quantity of tests covering a similar range of activities within the system on a test. So test design is based on models. Now, I've said before that models aren't necessarily written down. They might simply be ideas in our heads, which are temporary, which we use as part of our exploratory testing activity. But essentially, there are two, two phases in our testing. There's test analysis and what I've called exploration. And then there's test design, select test selection and execution. And what I've called testing, if you like, in the new model for testing I showed you in the last video. So test analysis or exploration is where we create models of the environment, the system, uh, the human nature, goals, risks, and so on. Anything that's relevant that will help us to get a better handle on the problem we have in front of us. And when we have that model and we trust it, that it, it's a reasonable representation of how the system or our users would behave, we select test items from that model to drive this concept of test design. And we pick tests, we pick models that we believe that will give and provide the most valuable test cases. So test models help us select tests in a systematic way, meaningful to stakeholders. What do test models do for us? Well, this is it. They simplify a complex problem and make it more straightforward for us to use. Our models, depending on what those models cover, is they focus on different aspects, whether it's the flow of control through a, a piece of software, through the states that are elements in that software uh, transitions from and to, whether it's the values of data that are relevant within a range of uh, valid and invalid values. So coverage items on models are identifiable and we can use them as measurable targets. What they also do, what these tests derived from a model also do, is they ensure usually a, an evenly distributed set of tests with respect to the models we use. And what that means is when we uh, select a model and create tests, we can be reasonably confident that uh, overall the areas of the model are tested evenly because we've used a, a very uh, clearly identifiable coverage item to exercise in our tests. So we have an even spread of test activity across the system based on the model we've used. Now one important thing to say is that usually in a systems testing regime, a strategy, we need multiple models. So uh, user tests to start at the end are typically based on uh, the usage of data across systems or multiple systems and basically the use of the business process as our guiding uh, principle to create paths through our business process, exercising the system as we go. When we're testing uh, low-level components, we probably use code-based models. Uh, program flow itself and the decisions made within the code itself are going to steer our test activity, typically for developers. Some tests might be architecture-based, looking at the integration between components and the overall movement of data between uh, low-level components and systems to systems at those different, differing levels. So we always need multiple models. 
In the next video, I'm going to talk a little bit more deeply about coverage.